Welcome to Eco Summit TV. This is Jan Michael Hess, and next to me is a uh, Bill. McDonough, William McDonough, he's actually one of the two co-founders of Cradle to Cradle. And we are very happy, Bill, that you are here in Berlin. You came all the way from California to uh, tell us how we can make better design and better architecture in the future. So first of all, I would like to ask you about the origin. When did you get into Cradle to Cradle and uh, where and when did you meet Michael Braungart? <laughs> Well, I got into the things that connect up to become Cradle to Cradle uh, very early while I was a student mm -hmm. at Yale in architecture school. And I built the first solar house in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And so I, I worked on the energy side of this. But at the same time, I was building it myself by hand. So I ended up like handling um, urea formaldehyde insulation and thinking to myself, what is this material, you know? And, what is formaldehyde, not knowing anything about these things. So I started to think about it. And my attitude was at th those days, just if it doesn't feel good or, um, you know, if it smells wrong, don't use it. So, you know, that was how crude it was when you're 21 years old or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then later I designed an office in New York for the Environmental Defense Fund, mm -hmm. which was considered the first green office in New York. And the next was five years later. And then, um, and then we helped start uh, green building issues um, with the professions. And then in 1989, I won a competition in Germany for a daycare center. And I started to think about, you know, what I wanted was a building like a tree that was negatively entropic. In other words, it was a building that made more energy need to operate, mm -hmm. that it accrued carbon. Mm -hmm. And it, you, the children could garden on the roof. They could manage all the shutters and insulation. So they operated the building, the children. And so I worked on that concept as a building like a tree. And then, um, and I realized I needed somebody who was a scientist because the children were chewing on everything. Mm. in these daycare centers. I had no idea, mm. you know, that, and what kind of finishes are on this furniture they're chewing up or mm. this carpet they're mm. crawling on and all that. So I had prepared myself to meet an ecotoxicologist someday. I was looking mm -hmm. for that. And then I had this great moment in New York where uh, people came to see me and said that Michael Brongard is coming to New York to set up his new office. And I was the first person there. I was very early because I wanted to make sure I got to talk to him. Mm. And we went up on the roof of his new office and started talking, and that was 20 years ago, and we haven't stopped. So I think the issue here for me is that Michael's genius in thinking about industrial production and, mm. and the systems and the metabolisms of biological and technical, and then combining that with design, which is a signal of intention, that if you have this kind of information and this kind of mental model you know, that Michael would describe, this is the biosphere, this is the technosphere. I think that's a great discovery in the human history, actually. And one of the reasons that he and I have, um, you know, been able to give away some of the intellectual property to the public mm. is because it's not an invention. Mm. It's not intellectual property. Mm. The reason is, what he's saying is, is a discovery. It's really the truth that we have two metabolisms. 5,000 years ago, we had one. 5,000 years ago, we had nature. In the beginning was only nature, and now we have nature and technology. Right. Two metabolisms. Two metabolisms, yeah. yeah. And we need to design them in, in, um, in, uh, in, uh, synchro in a synchronous way, right? right. Together. Right. right, because very often, you know, if the technical um, products which contain things like minerals that might be heavy metals, if they're allowed to get into the biosphere, that's what we call pollution, mm. right? It's the wrong material in the wrong place. Mm. Or it's a, it's a material that doesn't know if it's good or bad. Mm. See, lead doesn't know if it's good or bad. It's bad in the biosphere. In the technosphere, it's solder. Mm. The minute we let the technosphere release its products into the biosphere, then it's a neurotoxin. But if we use it in a computer that is infinitely used within that technosphere without ever being released to a child on a river in China or whatever, it just stays right there in a contained system, then it's not a neurotoxin. So you don't have to say no lead. 
because the problem with that is you're not saying what we want. You're not undefined. You're just not led. So that's useless to us. But if you're defined and you're led in a continuously closed loop that never sees the biosphere, well then you're just a nutrient. Mm. And without these nutrients, we couldn't have the technologies we have. So it's not a good or a bad, it's just a mineral. We give it value with our intention. So basically you are the first architect who discovered uh, Michael Braungart because you were looking for this kind of competence and you were sensitive that you needed somebody like him. Why were you so sensitive for, them, for this kind of expertise? What made you aware of this expertise um, in the first place? I didn't know it existed. Okay. Um, so I started doing research after this daycare center visit. That's when I really got the... So the children, basically. Children said... Yeah. It happens to so many people, right? The when they think of children. <laughs> yeah. It's curiosity. Yeah. And I knew there had to be somebody there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did research, and it was clear there was his teacher, Corta, and there was him, you know, the Greenpeace chemistry wizard. And that suited me because I'm, you know, was working with all the environmental groups trying to solve this problem. And there didn't seem to be anybody dealing with it. Mm -hmm. Um, there were a lot of people worrying about volatile organic compounds and indoor air quality by, the, by 1990. Mm. Not that many. Mm. When we started in 1984, in the United States, the, the uh, U.S. engineering, what's called ASHRAE, American Society of Heating and Ventilating Engineers, um, they, um, they had just started thinking about VOCs and indoor air quality. And the EPA headquarters in Washington had just been discovered as a super sick building. Mm. And that was it. And there were a few people, you know, buying milk paints from Germany or, you know, looking for better light bulbs or something. But it was a very big, it was really early. And Michael had been there from the beginning, so. If we uh, fast forward to the presence to today, now we are standing in Berlin at the Cradle to Cradle Festival. And how successful have you been in order to motivate other people out there to follow the cradle-to-cradle -cradle philosophy, to build more cradle-to-cradle -cradle buildings, to design cradle-to-cradle -cradle products? I, I suppose you're not the only one. So how happy are you with the progress during the last uh, 20 years since you met uh, Michael? Well, I think the, um, from a, per, a um, very specific cradle-to-cradle -cradle perspective mm -hmm. uh, in terms of buildings, mm -hmm. um, I think we see a huge platform that's formed with the U.S. Green Building Council, with LEED, with German standards, with Dutch standards, with British standards, and they're all moving in this direction. And that, that I think in many parts, I know in the United States, was inspired mm. by a few of us back in the late 80s. Um, but what's happening now is probably what had to happen uh, for people to see Cradle to Cradle and its value. Mm. Two things. One is that um, I think they've hit the wall and realized that efficiency is insufficient mm. to really what we have to do. Mm. And I think that took, you know, for the first uh, 10 years of Cradle to Cradle was really Michael and I putting design and intention and his science and our uh, outreach and communications and so on and working it out. We had lots to work out. We still do. And... And then the next 10 years was like trying to tell all the people, just trying to be less bad, that there might be a strategy about more good mm -hmm. and that it was come and we were working on it and they could celebrate it. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of our clients like Steelcase or Herman Miller, who I worked in the States or people that Michael's worked with here, where you can see, you know, would see it and be attracted to it. And then it's taken us the last 10 years to get to where we are in this exhibit. Mm -hmm. which is a celebration of really Michael's work, I think, mm -hmm. uh, which is marvelous mm -hmm. and, and is a celebration of that festival. And so, and we're doing, you know, same kind of thing in the States, and, but not as, as product focused as Michael's. We're doing, um, you know, trying to look at what it means to buildings and communities and, and, um, and to, the, to the culture, mm -hmm. you know. So... It's very nice to see all this because this is real here. Now I think everybody's ready. I think it took 20 years. And people keep saying, you know, isn't it great how fast this is going? You know? mm. And sure, you know, but it took 20 years. <laughs> <laughs>